hey, so we were doing a real quick recap of what went on on Friday. Um, so first off, in our discussion, we tried to disprove phrenology. And a lot of that revolved around app, um, applying the scientific method that you've talked about in other courses, and you can quickly Google an image of it, uh, in order to attempt to disprove a science like phrenology and to structure science better in the future. So issues that students brought up in phrenology were sample size problems. Because the sampling was you know, smaller than, than could have measured the entire global population, and that also there was bias in the sampling uh, to try and create this feeling of a superiority for Europeans. They were trying to confirm a hypothesis they had or a racial feeling they had through a fake science. So we have to avoid confirmation bias. We have to avoid sample size errors and sampling problems when we don't include things like diversity in our experimentation. So those were identified as problems in phrenology. And our new experiments have to make sure that they don't do that. And so students created experiments such as um, administering a test to people as a baseline and then educating them over time, seeing if that um, baseline shifted, did they learn more, and then we measure the skull at the beginning and we measure the skull at the end to see if it actually changed. So we get a baseline knowledge level, we get a baseline skull measurement, and then we create the experiment, we run through our processes, our hypothesis is that the skull size will not change, we test that hypothesis, we collect our data at the end. Others involve using more modern technology to uh, see what's happening in the brain, to see if brain sizes actually relate to intelligence, things like that went into it. So there's a lot of different methodologies that students came up with. Uh, you're welcome to generate one of your own. Then we got a little bit into psychology that we're going to cover next week. A guy named Wilhelm Wundt in the uh, late 1800s created something called structuralism which was the belief that we could break down the human experience into a bunch of tiny little pieces and we could measure them through introspection. So what that meant was that we would take the human experience and if I taught you to leave out all the emotional part of it, you could just describe the exact inputs. An example would be biting into an apple. What exactly do you feel? What exactly do you taste in the immediate moment? He didn't want what he called immediate feelings where you took a tool and measured because there was a time lapse involved. He wanted immediately, what are the sensory inputs going into you when you eat a thing, when you touch a thing, when you feel contact on your skin. And by breaking down those exact things, his belief was we could get objective data. We take all the feeling and emotion out of it. Now, as we get into structuralism next week, we're gonna find that there's a big difficulty in avoiding subjective data in psychology. Subjective being when my feelings or emotions influence what I'm saying to you. So objective versus subjective data is going to be part of what we discuss here. Wundt wanted structuralism to take out the emotion and he didn't want to hear about your feeling and your experience and your perception. He only wanted the data. And the question is, is that even possible? Can we ever get a human response about a reaction to something without the data being subjective? Hopefully this helps. I'll put this on YouTube. I'll send it out to some of our students who missed. Uh, please feel free to email me with any questions. I'd be glad to elaborate on any part and post uh, class sessions, uh, which will be available on Blackboard.